And when you go to the doctor's office, you're not really getting an accurate blood pressure. You're, you know, you're very likely to be susceptible to white coat hypertension. And even if you're not, rarely is a protocol correctly used for measuring blood pressure. It's very important where your arm is in relation to your heart. It has to be at the exact same level, can't be above it, can't be below it. You need to be resting for five minutes before you have the blood pressure checked. You can't be talking, you can't have your legs crossed. You know, all of these things have to be done. And we find the only way to really do this with our patients is frankly, just to have them do it at home twice a day, every day and keep a, a long log. That's the only way we can really get an accurate assessment of their blood pressure. So still so step one is you just have to know that number. And then if it's elevated, here's an area where I think the, the sort of quote unquote lifestyle metrics do a lot more value than before you have to go down the pharmacologic route. So on that note, well, one, that's definitely happened to me, you know, recently I went in and I was nervous about something and it was like 140 over 80. And I said, all right, give me three minutes. And I, you know, to my nasal breathing, try to watch my heart rate and then boom, back to 120. <laughs> uh, happens to everyone. And on that note, I'm curious, okay, if, if I am taking one of these pharmaceutical interventions for ApoB, does that, so, does that also benefit blood pressure? Or no, that's more lifestyle modification. No, I mean, there's lots of medications for blood pressure, but um, fixing ApoB does not fix blood pressure or vice versa. Um, but we can get more bang for our buck out of lifestyle changes on blood pressure than we can ApoB. Well, we'll, we'll go there. So what are some of those? I, I I still want to come back to finish testing, but what quickly while we're on the subject, what are some of those lifestyle modifications that go a long way? Again, there's no surprises here. Exercise, weight loss, sleep, and stress reduction are the big ones. Those have all of those have significant impact on blood pressure. Um, and so, on the exercise front, it seems specifically more around uh, cardio training than strength training. So both are very important. But when it comes to lowering blood pressure, we probably get more bang for a buck out of cardio training. Uh, and it doesn't have to be insanely intense, right? It's, you know, the kind of the zone two training that I talk about all the time. Fixing sleep if sleep is a problem. So sleep apnea can cause blood pressure. So that's, again, another one of those things we like to rule out in everybody. So we, you know, we, we do a test that you can find online. <clears throat> in fact, I link to it in the book. It's called the stop bang test. And it's just a very simple questionnaire you can find online that will tell you if you're kind of high or low risk for sleep apnea. So if you come out on the stop bang test, very low risk, you're almost assuredly fine. If you come out high risk, it's really worth getting a proper sleep evaluation because undiagnosed sleep apnea, which by the way, we have a stereotype that that only exists in overweight people or only exists in people who are snoring. That's simply not the case. Uh, thin people, metabolically healthy people can still have sleep apnea, even though it's less common. So you have to make sure you don't have sleep apnea and we have to make sure you're, you're sleeping, you know, seven to nine hours a night. And if you're not, there's a, if you're sleeping outside those windows, you're at higher risk of high blood pressure. Um, weight, there's a very clear relationship between body weight and blood pressure. And so, you know, as, as one fixes body weight, should they be in the overnourished camp, as I describe it, uh, we're going to see blood pressure come down. And then the hardest one to fix, and perhaps one of the most important is actually stress. Um, you know, being in a constant state of on, just being in a sympathetic tone, the fight or flight response that's, you know, never being turned off uh, has obviously profound consequences on blood pressure. So coming back to some of those labs that we should just demand our doctor do that maybe when they're not doing, and I mentioned LPA, and that was one of my insurance to the state is still not covered. They, they, it's, it's not that expensive, no big deal, but I have to demand, demand a I think a lot of people have to demand they get tested for that one. What, what are some other others that immediately come to mind? Maybe a handful. Well, in addition to ApoB and LP little a, I think everybody should know their ApoE genotype. That certainly gives us some additional information about the risk of cardiovascular disease and perhaps more importantly, the risk of Alzheimer's disease. I think that <clears throat> knowing that information can be actually very important as you think about how to take steps to prevent uh, or at least significantly delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. These are not deterministic genes, meaning if you have ApoE4, 4 is the isoform that is the high risk isoform. If you have one or two copies of the ApoE4, it's not, uh, it's not a given that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, but you are at increased risk and therefore one should take, you know, precautions. It's sort of like saying, you know, if you, if you had a gene that knew you were more susceptible to lung cancer, knowing that would be very valuable if you were ever tempted to smoke. 
It would also potentially be tempting, uh, or it would be helpful to to inform you how to screen for that cancer, right? So we, we do this all the time, right? Women are advised if their family history is suggestive of breast cancer to make sure they don't have breast cancer genes. Why? Because they can act on that information and prevent breast cancer. Similarly, knowing that you have an ApoE4 gene uh, will allow you to do a lot of things to mitigate the risk of dementia. Other things that I think are worth understanding or paying attention to, I think, you know, looking at insulin, looking at liver function tests, and understanding, by the way, that um, that the laboratory standards for those things are often not what I would call uh, physiologically appropriate. In other words, the when you look at a lab test and it says a normal range is you know, 20 to 45, what it's usually showing you is the fifth to 95th percentile of the population currently as being tested. 